Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast, where we discuss films from every genre. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Today we are discussing the third installment in our Humphrey Bogart retrospective series, the critically acclaimed The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. This is your co-host Corbin. <laughs> I'm Alan from Chicago. I guess that must be just the subtitle, The Critically Acclaimed Sierra Madre. Yes, that is the official subtitle. <laughs> no, just kidding. This is, it's more critically acclaimed than I thought. What, I mean, uh, we'll get into kind of what it's rated and what how it uh, kind of made a splash when it first came out. But you always hear about Casablanca, which we did review. You can go listen right. to our review. And then you always hear about the Maltese Falcon. The Treasure of the Sierra Madre is well known. It's well liked. But I had no idea once I watched this documentary attached to the Blu-ray. This movie is huge. In some ways, bigger than Casablanca. Now, that's even... That's quite surprising. I mean, I have heard of the Sierra Madre before. But I really knew nothing about it aside from just the name. Uh, and yeah, even when I was just doing some research for this, I was like... It's Roger Ebert's, like, no, no, Stanley Kubrick's, like, fourth favorite movie of all time, which is kind of a big deal. So I didn't realize how big it was with critics, I maybe even back in the day, and probably even as well as it is now. But, yeah, very surprising that this movie is as critically acclaimed as it is. Because, yeah, like you said, we usually only hear about uh, Casablanca or Maltese Falcon, not as much about Treasure, Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Not to say that it isn't, not to say that it isn't there, but... Not as much. Well, they're nearly rated the same on IMDb. Casablanca has right. an eight point five, and Treasure of the Sierra Madre has an eight point three. Now, uh, and they actually won the exact same amount of Oscars. Uh, Casablanca had a few more nominations, and of course, Casablanca is way higher on IMDb's top two hundred and fifty. It's number thirty six, and this is number one twenty. Right, uh, natural. That just seems kind of natural, though. But the Oscars that did win were John Huston won. John Huston, we also should note, uh, directed The Maltese Falcon. Right, yeah. He's kind of, we're coming back to uh, John Huston. I think we even mentioned in that podcast that him and Humphrey Bogart were kind of like a team, like you would think, like you would see now with uh, Christopher Nolan and, uh, uh, crap, Michael Caine, that's his name, or... Damien Chazelle and Ryan Gosling. It's kind of one of those pairs of director and actor that just do a lot of movies together. Yeah, it, it is. And even after The Maltese Falcon, they did Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Then right after that, they did Key Largo together. And they've done a few others as well. And right. I'll be honest, listeners, I'll tell you right now. This is my favorite Bogart movie that I've seen. I have fond memories of watching this with my dad in the summer. I love watching Bogart with him, and this is one of my favorites. I'll save telling you why it's one of my favorites, but just to start off the bat, I do love this movie. And I know I've heard this before, uh, that you this is one of your favorites. So it'd be interesting to see where our conversation goes uh, here from here on out. Not to say that it isn't a great movie. I would just go out and say it now. I think it is a very, very good movie. Uh, but I am completely new to this. This is nothing I've seen before. So it'll be interesting to have a someone who's had experience with this and somebody, as usual, who has had no experience with this. This tends to be a thing that we try to do as often as we can. And I should note, I did mention the it did win the Oscar for Best Director. John Huston won that. He also wrote the screenplay, and then, bam, he won the Oscar again right after. <laughs> well, he won Best Star Writer, and then, he won the, and then he won the Oscar for Best Director, and then his dad who plays in this movie as one of the main characters, won Best Supporting Actor. And that's so cool because I think that's the only time in cinema history a father and son have won the Academy Award for the same movie. That's pretty impressive, though. Oh, yeah. that It's really cool. I didn't know mm -hmm. that until doing the um, studying for this movie. It did also was nominated for Best Picture, but it lost Best Picture to Laurence Olivier's Hamlet. Many people were surprised by this because many thought it would get Best Picture. But at the time, British movies were extremely popular. They called this time period kind of the British invasion in Hollywood, where a lot of British actors were, you know, big stars. And uh, the people in this movie, 
Despite us thinking of Humphrey Bogart as a big star today, which he is in our minds, at the time, he really wasn't what we would consider just this big Tom Cruise-esque star. Uh, he, t It took him a long time before he got to where he was, and it was these movies, uh, The Maltese Falcon, then Casablanca, and then right after that, he was able to sign a big picture deal with Warner Brothers, and the first movie he did right after that was this movie, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and he signed a picture deal with Warner Brothers. They're like, you'll get at least one movie a year, and each movie you'll get paid $200,000, which is huge, but it took Humphrey Bogart to be a middle-aged person before he achieved this, and uh, I'll tell you in just a minute what his fans thought of this role. Uh, they weren't too pleased, but uh, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Yeah, that is, now of course, $200,000 back in that those days is a lot of money. Uh, of course, we now have inflation, so it just looks like it's not as much, but even then, <laughs> right. it's a good sum of money. Oh yeah, it, it really is. So like I said, I have the Blu-ray, I have the the best of Bogart collection on Blu-ray, which I highly recommend you pick up. It comes with a lot of great of his films and some nice bonus features and collectibles as well. Uh, one thing I kind of wanted to mention, just it was kind of funny on the Blu-ray. I, it came with a Looney Tunes cartoon. Really? Yeah. It was called huh. eight ball bunny. It was one of the old Looney Tunes. And I guess because they're both made by Warner brothers, they're like, Hey, let's include a Looney Tunes cartoon from the era. Mm -hmm. It was, that's weird. interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So I do want to give you listeners some background into this movie. The creation of this movie is pretty crazy. Actually, I had no idea any of this production history until, uh, watching this movie and watching this documentary, but it's pretty wild to say the least. So this is based upon a book of the same title. The book is written by B. Traven. And this person named B. Traven, they traveled to Mexico not long after the American Civil War to witness kind of this gold rush in Mexico where a lot of these American corporations and people of all uh, races and ethnicities were rushing down there to strike it rich. And B. Traven was pretty much disgusted by the whole ordeal, and he blamed um, these Americans coming into Mexico and just raping the land of all of its, you know, resources. He blamed it on capitalism. So he wrote this book called The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and his book teems with anti-capitalism, anti-materialism. It challenges the Spanish oppression of the native Indians, and it has a strong indictment on the church's role in all of this. I can't help but point out the irony, though, because this movie is made by capitalists getting rich from the movie. That is very ironic. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, anyways. So the big catch is no one knew who B. Traven was. And to this day, nobody actually really knows who he is. Interesting. His identity has always remained a secret, and it's known as the riddle of B. Traven. Hmm. So the book was published in the United States in 1935, but it was published originally in German in the mid-1920s because he didn't want it published in any capitalist country. Interesting. Yeah. So, but the film was rejected by Warner Brothers twice before this because it was considered too downbeat. It was originally suggested to be turned into a South American melodrama comedy. Uh -huh. Yeah, it didn't work. They shut that down immediately. They're like, that's stupid. So eventually, the very young director, John Huston, comes on the scene. He loved the book, and he petitioned his agent to secure the rights for the movie. But the problem is, World War II broke out. John Houston was drafted. He was called up to go into the service, but luckily he got to make like World War II documentaries while he was in the war. But this movie that he really wanted to make is getting floated all around Hollywood. It's uh, it was announced that Edward G. Robinson, which who would star in Houston's next movie, Key Largo, it was announced he would be in the movie. Four different writers were writing different scripts, and. One of the partially written scripts was set in L.A. after World War II 
basically having almost nothing to do with the actual story. And there was this uh, producer named Blanc, and he really wanted Houston to make the movie. And he was worried because they actually did have a director, Vincent Sherman. He was just about to go into production for the movie when all of a sudden it's been rumored that Blanc crafted this ruse and had the Breen office claim the script was derogatory towards Mexicans, which shut down the production and they took the script away from Vincent Sherman. And this was all to keep the movie from any out of all Hollywood hands until John Houston can come back from the war. That is so interesting. Yeah. And when he did come back from the war, he tweaked just a few things because he wrote the script for this movie he himself, and then he also directed it. And a few of the things he tweaked from the book, uh, he softened the character Curtin to make him more of a counterpart to Dobbs, and he also turned the character Goldhat into um, Dobbs' darker alter ego. And after the script was finished, uh, he went riding in a steeplechase to celebrate it, but then he nearly died, and he nearly crashed and killed himself. And then he's like, oh, before I direct this movie, I want to go. He went to New York to direct No Exit on Broadway for a bit. Mm -hmm. What? And then he goes, then he comes to Burbank on uh, December 16th, 1946, to begin production on the movie. So... This guy's got a busy life coming off from the war and die, almost dying in a steeplechase. Then he goes to direct a Broadway play just to put the production on hold so he could direct a Broadway play. Anyways, so he comes back to Burbank only to quickly move production to Mexico to shoot on location. Right. I heard that this is one of the very first movies from Hollywood, technically speaking, that was ever shot on location. Yes, that's correct. That was a really big deal at the time because films were not shot on location because studios had built giant back lots and uh, big sound stages so they could just recreate the environments they wanted to create for the movie without actually having to travel because that would be much more expensive to pack everybody up and travel and bring right. all the equipment and stuff. But nevertheless, John Houston was adamant about shooting in Mexico and he kind of had to fight for it, but eventually he did get to shoot in Mexico. And uh, not to say this movie isn't shot on some sets because they did recreate a lot of the city of Tampico on Warner Brothers sets. And ultimately, uh, the movie, I'll get into this in just a minute, it went way over shooting schedule. So then they had to move it back to the Warner Brothers lots and they finished shooting the movie there. Um but while in Mexico, Houston and the author Traven corresponded via letters, and Traven was supposed to meet Houston in Mexico. And Houston claims he woke up one night to a man standing over him named Hal Croves, who claimed to be Traven's representative, and he stayed on and was consultant on, on the film while they shot in Mexico. Interesting. And Houston... Uh, People speculated that Croves was actually Traven, just changing his name, but many people didn't believe it. Even his, like, people have written about him. Even John Houston himself did not believe Croves to be Traven, but at Croves' death, he claimed he was B. Traven, but, hmm. but nobody believed him. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, the mystery still stands. The, it, the mystery still stands. It is not confirmed who B. Traven is, and likely nobody will ever know who it was who wrote the book. Right. So anyways, John Houston and Traven, the like he had correspondence with them, they had a falling out and after the movie was shot and Traven said, Houston will never adapt one of my books again because he um, was trying to say how Croves was me and that's not true. And it was a really silly scenario. Mm -hmm. But uh, something that really cool happened was um, John's father, Walter Houston, who was an established actor – um, was going to be cast in the movie, and with Traven's approval, he was originally going to be the role of Dobbs. Interesting. Which is weird, because Walter Houston plays Howard, the old man, and yeah. uh, not Dobbs is a much younger man in the movie, but that's kind of who Traven wanted. Uh, that didn't work out. They had him as Howard. They recast him. And uh, I should say that we've actually seen Wal Walter Houston in John's previous movie, The Maltese Falcon. Really? 
Yes, I had to think about it for a bit too, and ultimately I had to look it up. He plays the bit part as an in-joke of Captain Jacoby when he brings Falcon into Humphrey Bogart's office and he has the knife in his back. Oh, okay. That's Walter okay. Houston. That's his dad. Gotcha. All right. So as for the role of Curtin, originally it was actually going to be played by Ronald Reagan. Now, that would have been very interesting to see because I know that he was an actor. I know that probably because of Back to the Future. Yeah. Uh, but it would have been interesting to, ha- to see a movie and actually review one on here with Ronald Reagan as the lead, or a lead or a character, a main character in the story, which we haven't done yet. It would be fascinating. I've never seen a Ronald Reagan movie, but I will say I am glad they landed on Tim Holt, who plays in this movie, and his father, Jack Holt, was a very famous uh, leading man, and he's actually in this movie. He is the oh. hobo sitting at Howard's feet when they go to that hostel. And when we first are in the hostel and we first meet Howard, he's talking to a okay. guy, and that's um, uh, Tim Holt's dad. So it's really cool gotcha. how there's a lot of father and son dynamics in this movie. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, at the time, Tim Holt was just really known for being in B-movie cowboy movies, but then he would just all of a sudden pop up in powerful dramas, like critically acclaimed dramas like Orson Welles' The Magnificent Ambersons, which is coming out on Criterion soon. I'm looking forward to that. And then he came out in Sierra Madre. So he was mostly a B B B actor in cowboy movies, but then all of a sudden he would be in these bigger movies. Also, the uh, actor Bruce Bennett, who plays Cody, his original name is actually Herman Bricks. He actually competed in the 1932 Olympics as a shot putter. Ooh, how interesting. Uh, this movie is just like, what? All these actors and different people. I, it's crazy. Yeah. So, and I should note that John Houston himself is in this movie. Okay. Did you recognize him? No. I didn't either until I saw the special features. Okay, you know in the beginning of the movie where Bogart's character is walking around asking for money and he keeps running into the guy with the white suit? Yeah. That's John Houston. Well, that explains why he looks so familiar to me. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really cool how he put himself in the movie. And there's mm-hmm. I there's also another famous person with a bit part in this movie. I don't remember their name. But uh, they just made a point to show that all of these big cameos were, like, placed with within the movie. Yeah. So when they did shoot on location, it was really hot and miserable. John Huston loved it, and Bogart hated it. So the other really cool thing is all the actors you see in Mexico are either uh, actual Mexican actors, or most of them are actually just walk-on people. And reportedly, even one of them was a real bandit. Interesting. I know that they actually paid them, I think, 10 pesos, which is roughly two bucks a day to act, which even then was a pretty good deal of money for those, uh, for, I guess, the actors that were natural, I guess, that came from this location. So, But yeah. I did know that there was one that was actually a bandit that may have been on set, reportedly. It's really cool, though, because it lends itself to the believability of these films that these people aren't actually actors. They are actually just local Mexicans who just kind of walked on right. for those you know, bit parts or background extras. But the problem was the film was going way over its shooting schedule, which caused Jack Warner, the creator of Warner Brothers, clearly. He was really nervous. He's like, what's going on here? And also he was pretty nervous because Bogart was known as a clean-shaven gangster type, but he looks really scruffy and disheveled and gross, and they're like, oh my gosh, the leading man looks horrible. What are people going to think of this? Mm -hmm. Because that was so uncommon back then. So, but going over shooting schedule was actually frustrating Bogart, and one night they were sitting down to dinner. Bogart gets kind of loud and vocal with Houston about... Hey, I, I've got a boat race that I want to go to. I don't really want to keep shooting this movie forever. So John Houston grabbed Humphrey Bogart's nose and twisted it so hard that it caused Humphrey Bogart's wife, who is the famous actress Lauren Bacall, who those two would actually star in John Houston's next movie, Key Largo, together. She was down there on shoot, like just cooking them home-cooked meals. 
Uh, she she's like started yelling at John Houston, saying, "You're hurting my husband. What the heck's going on?" And after that, Humphrey Bogart never complained on set again. Oh my! He twisted his nose. That's very very interesting. This is this is probably one of the more interesting uh, production background info segments I think I've ever heard in our podcast so far. I think so too. But finally, shooting ended. It took them five and a half months, which was 29 days over schedule. Which is still pretty long. I mean, today, movies shoot within around three months or so-ish, give or take about a month and a half. Oh, yeah. It's pretty long. It was way too long. He, Jack Warner was telling John Houston, get back here. We can shoot some of these shots at the end. I mean, we can shoot that anywhere here in California. And he's like, no. I'm shooting them in Mexico, yeah. and I'm not coming back until I'm done shooting. <laughs> right. Well, when the movie finally did hit theaters, it had rave reviews from the critics. Uh, the only thing that critics didn't care for was a lot of critics deemed the score was melodramatic and heavy-handed at times. I guess I can see why they would think that. So, and at the time, this was considered, by critics, Humphrey Bogart's best performance. I can see that too. And mind you, Casablanca had already come out. Right, which is a pretty big deal. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, Bogart's fans at the time didn't like his performance because he was unsavory, he wasn't romantic, and he just wasn't a gangster. I mean, it is a very different role from what you normally see Humphrey Bogart doing because usually he's like a private investigator and is uh, rather tough and very monotone right rather different in this movie he's kind of all over the place yeah he is uh it's just funny because today we love character actors and just like people who do mm -hmm. kind of more regular type of acting as well but it's just funny to be frustrated over a actor doing something different yeah <laughs> Right. Well, anyways, it, this movie kind of had a lot of trouble marketing itself, and the marketing department had no idea how to present this to the audience. Um, one of their ideas was they created a men's clothing line to tie in with the movie, but it the clothes were nothing like what they wore in the movie. It was just a bunch of suits of like, uh, and they had Humphrey Bogart endorse it by wearing these suits, and they said these are the tie-in suits to the Treasure of the Sierra Madre movie. And they had like a women on the front covers of the posters to try and make it look kind of romantic and intriguing. And uh, they're like, how do we market this kind of movie? Because audiences at the time were used to romantic movies where the leading man gets the leading lady. There's no leading lady in this movie, which was really different for the time. Also, it's pretty uh, bleak for the whole movie where Basically, a bunch of men are just at each other's throats the whole time, constantly threatening violence and descending into madness. Audiences weren't used to that. Audiences, yeah, there might be some bad things going on in the movie, but there's always a happy ending. And for this kind of movie, they're like, what? I'm not spoiling the ending here, listeners, but they were just um, expecting, they just wanted a happy movie. And it was interesting because Robert Osborne, the famous film historian and TCM host, said it was a miracle this movie even got made because Western audiences wanted a happy movie with a happy ending, whereas in the East, like in Europe, movies were taking real looks at human lives and outcomes. And despite critics loving it and some audiences appreciating it, most audiences didn't really care for it at the time, therefore it did poorly at the box office. And Osborne further said, we should forgive the audience at the time because they weren't ready for this more European-esque film, which I found that to be really fascinating. Yeah, and I know that, especially at the time, typically your socioeconomic standings is by the clothes you wear around this era. That's just kind of how the society worked. And so, yeah, even like you said, having them kind of dressed a bit more drab and not really in the most, uh, most elaborate-looking suits and having to push suits as part of the clothing line for the movie when in reality they had nothing really to do with the story. It's it's such a, it's very interesting because it I guess you could even say it's kind of ahead of its time because of at least the way that the story is told and it not necessarily being something that the audience has been used to, which is being very romantic. This is very kind of not so, which is very, very interesting. Oh, very much so. This movie 
is what really opened up the doors for allowing movies in the West to not always have a happy ending per se, or the leading man was kind of a bad guy. Bogart was considered the first anti-hero and uh, not just for this movie, but for other movies as well. So right. yeah, because nowadays we have very, you know, postmodern movies or things just before the podcast, Alan and I were talking about the Sicario movies and those aren't very happy movies, but they tell a great story. And I think we can attribute some of that to this movie actually, because of a lot of the things it did differently that really shocked audiences, but it did open up for more movies to take a look at kind of real life humanity and interactions and not just this kind of fairy tale, noir-esque world. And at this time, too, World War II had really kind of just ended, ended about three years before this. Uh, and so, at least with those movies, you kind of really wanted more happy endings because of the World War. Right. So it was just kind of very, very interesting, uh, even with that, that this movie kind of didn't exactly have one of those. It was like you kind of like insinuated it's kind of depicting real life, which, as we kind of already been discussing here, is not something... Not necessarily that they haven't been doing this, but not something, at least in this way, that Hollywood has really been pursuing uh, to tell a story as much as anybody else. And of course, John Huston, it, it sounds like he just really likes to push, at least in this time of uh, this time of film, he really pushed for things that we would see all happen a lot later on. Citizen Kane, I know, was one that had a lot of different things that you really, filmmaking techniques that you really hadn't ever seen before. And then this one kind of goes to show that you can still tell a story with a very sad and not so happy ending and make it even, maybe even a greater impact on the audience with that. Another kind of shock at the time was when it did get to the Oscars, we already talked about that, but many people were shocked Bogart didn't get nominated for his role in this movie. That is kind of a shock. I wonder, wh who did he get beat out by? Oh, I don't know. I do not know who was up for best actor at the time, but he didn't even get on the nomination list, which is surprising considering Houston won two Oscars and his dad also did, and the movie was nominated for best picture, but... Bogart didn't, and many con many considered it his best role at the time. I can definitely see that. Okay, uh, looking at it now, the lead actor for Hamlet won best actor. Still, though, that is that is very surprising that he didn't get a uh, nomination for this because if it's considered, I mean, it's considered to be one of his best roles, and of course we'll get into that and talk about it. But that is very interesting because Hogart Hobart Hogart. It's been even at this point, it's been considered to be a great actor, I would assume. Well, listeners, hopefully that crazy backstory to the movie hopefully whetted your appetite to hear what we have to say about it. We are going to get into spoilers for Treasure of the Sierra Madre. So if you don't want this movie spoiled for you, then I recommend that you click pause right now. Go out and rent the movie, watch it, come back and click play, and we'll be ready to talk about it. Spoilers ahead. Tampico, Mexico, February 1925. Fred C. Dobbs, played by Humphrey Bogart, is a down-on-his-luck guy without a penny to his name. He spends his days bothering fellow Americans if they'll stake him for a meal. He, be he befriends a fellow homeless man named Curtin, played by Tim Holt. The two find work with a man named McCormick, played by Barton McLean, who guarantees he'll pay them as soon as they get back to Tampico, except he never pays them. A few days later, they find him in a bar and beat the snot out of him, taking their share of the money. That night, they buy a room in a hostel where they meet Howard, played by Walter Houston, who tells other homeless men of his experience mining gold. Curtin and Dobbs get the idea to team up with Howard to see if they can strike it rich in the Asir Mira Madre Mountains. After a long, arduous journey, they begin to find gold, but quickly worry about maintaining their fair share. They split their daily findings three ways, each hiding theirs from the other in a secret location. One day, the gold mine caves in on Dobbs, who has already threatened murder on the others, but Curtin saves his life with little thanks from Dobbs. As the day goes on, the atmosphere between the three becomes increasingly tense. Dobbs begins talking to himself, assuming the others are conspiring against him. 
Curtin is unsure of the whole ordeal, and Howard remains the most level-headed after having losing his previous gold fortune from greed. The group needs fresh supplies, so Curtin rides into town where he encounters another American named Cody, played by Bruce Bennett, who has come to find gold in the mountains. Curtin does his best to lie to Cody, claiming he is simply hunting in the mountains for pelts, but Cody figures otherwise, so he follows Curtin up the mountain, even after being told he is not welcome at Curtin's camp. When Cody arrives at the camp, he is surprised to find Curtin has two other companions. They begrudgingly allow him to spend the night, but the following morning, they vote to let Cody have it with their pistols. Before they can shoot him, Cody warns of a group of bandits coming up the mountain straight towards them. They either die together, or they work together to fend them off. Choosing the latter, the four bunker down and engage in a shootout with the bandits. Just when things begin to look grim as the group runs out of ammunition, the Federales, aka the Mexican police, chase the bandits out of the mountains. Curtin, Howard, and Dobbs survive, but they find Cody dead from a gunshot wound. On Cody's person, they find a letter from his wife, expressing how much she and their son miss him and hopes he'll return home soon because they're already rich in love and family. Not seeming to phase the group, they bury Cody, but that night Curtin claims he'll give a fourth of his share to Cody's widow, and Howard claims he'll do the same, whereas Dobb derides their compassion. Figuring they have enough gold to last them a lifetime, they begin the long trek down the mountain. One night, a group of native Indians asks for medical help. Howard leaves the group to help a sick boy recover. Curtin and Dobbs are left together, where they begin a game of cat and mouse started by Dobbs. See, Dobbs decides they'll just take Howard's share instead of meeting him in Durango to give it to him. But Curtin declines, so Dobbs makes a bet whoever falls asleep first will be the first one to die. Unfortunately, Curtin falls asleep and is shot twice by Dobbs. But he does not die and finds two locals who bring him to Howard, who is living it up. The two of them set out to overtake Dobbs and secure their gold. But Dobbs is nearing the end of his abilities to carry on when three bandits, the same ones from the mountain, murder him, stealing his burros and throwing away the gold dust into the wind, figuring it for sand. When Curtin and Howard find this out, they laugh off the ordeal as all is vanity. Howard gives Curtin his share of the money from the pelts and burrows, if he'll use the money to visit Cody's widow. Curtin agrees to go to Texas, where he'll meet the widow and son, and become a peach picker, his life stream. And Howard goes back to be the revered head of the village, as credits roll. And I think the one thing that really surprised me was, a would have been about the time that, actually it was the time when Cody died. Because uh, for like the first, I guess it would have been around an hour or so, I'm just like, I know where this movie's headed. I know exactly what it's trying to say. Money is the root of all evil. <laughs> it money corrupts everything and all kinds of stuff like that. Then it gets to the then it gets to Cody's death. And they spend a lot of time on talking about the wife and reading off the letter and things like with the wife and the son and things like that. And it's like, hang on. There is something more here that I didn't even consider. Uh, and that's not just the fact that money is the root of all evil and money corrupts men. That's part of it, yes. But the biggest chunk of it is that the real value in life is not necessarily material things, but it's others that we know and love. And we see that through Cody and we see that through uh, Curtin as he goes to visit the wife. And then you also see it through Howard as he kind of befriends this village that's just kind of there in the wilderness. Uh, and he kind of becomes their caretaker. And I was like, Crap, I didn't even consider that. Yeah, I think this movie does a fantastic job of showing these really interesting character arcs of all of these people completely down on their luck. They're all homeless and broke. They don't have any money to their name and what money they do have. They just kind of right. seem to spend it on alcohol or throwing it away somehow, getting haircuts and whatnot. Anyways, so these people begin so poor and then they really do strike it rich, especially for the time. It's, this takes place in 1925. $25,000 each in 1925 is great. They're going to live a nice, comfortable life, especially from where they were, sleeping on park benches and uh, oh, yeah. living this really scummy life. But I think it's really fascinating how it shows uh, how kind of this darkness of human nature and greed, essentially the fall of man, will just take over all and we kind of get this Cain and Abel scenario here towards the end 
of how, uh, you know, there, there's just this big power struggle. And uh, we see uh, Dobbs is the dark side of humanity. Curtin is kind of the in-between side where he said, yeah. like, I could go this way. And we do see him in the movie one time consider leaving Dobbs for dead within the mine. And considering, you know, I, I probably should just kill you to make things better. But then we also see he goes back to um, more the sentimental side of wanting to care for other people and have compassion on them and just be a peach picker, just a simple life. And right. Howard also is the same way. He's like, if I was a young man, I would have been tempted to shoot you also probably and just take it all for myself. But I've he's like learned so much in life and seen so much and gone through so many things. He's like, I just want to retire with a grocery store and read comic books. And he doesn't really do that. He still does retire, but just kind of lives a nice life. So I think this movie does a great job with those character arcs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I really like this that you got to get to see Humphrey Bogart's character Dobbs just he, to be fair, both Dobbs and Kern are really stupid here in this opening, and the movie does not shy away from showing that, especially when they're walking up the mountain and they think that they found gold as it's shimmering on the rocks. And they're just like, we found gold, we found gold, after they were like essentially saying, especially Dobbs, she's saying that we might as well just give up, it's too hard, you know? Um, then they see gold, and they're like, they're getting all happy and stuff, and they're jumping up and down, and then Howard comes after him and just laughs and says, this is fool's gold fool's gold this is completely worthless and they're just like what and they were just so confused uh you really get this sense that these men these two guys Curtin and dobbs really don't know what they're doing uh and luckily they have a mentor there uh howard that kind of shows them how to do things and that's how they kind of get their money uh but it's just kind of funny here in this opening how uh dobbs really never comes out of this he learns never isn't exactly learn to get away from his, I guess, ignorance here, he kind of channels it into something much different, which in the end, he becomes very, very greedy and tries to run off with the money, which, which we'll talk about what happens a bit later on. But we do get to see how Curtin, I guess you can kind of say, takes in Howard's, I guess, teachings in a different, much different way and kind of becomes smarter than what Dobbs was, I guess. Uh, and I think between John Huston and Humphrey Bogart, between the writing and the acting, this these like seeds of how Dobbs character will eventually become are set up here in the first act really well mm -hmm. because he's uh he is always the victim it seems like um no matter what is going on in life it's because somebody else didn't give him a fair shake and we do see him get taken right. advantage of but that's because well it's kind of like you said Dobbs and Curtin are just stupid and they do the work without getting any kind of compensation or contract up front so they just basically work for free but we do right. see Dobbs is like uh, prone to violence he is also just really basic and everything like wow you know I bet we can uh we'll find the gold really quick on the mountain and then we'll get rich and oh but no wait I I want to keep mining until we get at least fifty thousand dollars and he's quick to violence we see him beat up that one McCormick guy just to get the money uh, anyway, so I think the setup for Dobbs' character is absolutely great. And then how he reacts and develops over, or the opposite of develops, he devolves over certain situations. It seems completely yeah. natural for his character. Yeah, and I would even say that his really his entire character is kind of based off of hypocrisy. Because as you just kind of mentioned at the very beginning, he's like, oh, I'll just get so much money and that'll be fine. We can end it there. And then, because he does hear that Howard is warning him about the dangers of mining for gold even with partners uh and then when once that situation comes up he says how about we can we can go to twenty five thousand easy and there are a number of different con inconsistencies with his character where he says one thing and then when that thing comes up he completely just tears it down and says something completely different his character is really based off of a lot of hypocrisy uh in this in the story for good reason because that's just kind of how human nature is we do what's best for us more or less, we do whatever we think, we do whatever we feel uh, it makes us better and in our own in our own eyes. And so that kind of puts in the Hobbs and we do get to see how he just kind of, instead of where, uh, instead of like uh, Curtin and Howard, as they kind of progress and you guess you could even say learn something uh, that's beneficial towards them, uh, Dobbs does the complete opposite, as you were saying. He devolves and be, kind of becomes even more and more paranoid and mad as the movie goes along. And Walter Houston's character 
Howard has a really great line here in the beginning. He says, as long as there's no find, meaning no gold to find, the brotherhood lasts. But when there is a find, right. that's when the trouble starts. So he right. claims he's been in these situations many times before. And you're thinking, oh, well, he's easily just a big talker, like somebody who's living, who's a homeless person and claims they've been rich many times before. It doesn't really sound believable, but he's like, well, I'm no exception to the rule. I've, because of greed, you think... You're going to use all of your money to find more money, and it's ruined me. So uh, immediately we're set up with, um, I would say, it seems like we couldn't maybe trust Howard at first, but I would say he's probably more trustworthy because he admits his mistakes, and he admits like, yeah, I've done this wrong, whereas Dobbs is like, oh, I'd be satisfied with just any gold I find. And then right after mm -hmm. that he says, okay, I'm going to dream of piles of gold. So he makes a statement about not being greedy, and then he makes a statement about being greedy. It's like you said, that contradiction. And uh, I got to say, between Howard and Dobbs' character, it's a hard time picking which I think is like my favorite character, which is a better character because they're both so brilliant. But Walter Houston does such an amazing job as Howard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'm kind of with you there at the beginning, too, where I myself am just like... I don't know if I can trust Howard. Is he? In my notes, I even have. I even said I saw him guessing the old man is going to run off with the cash and just outsmart the other two men. That's kind of what I was thinking was going to end up happening, which doesn't happen. Uh, and and in, in in any sense, Dobbs is the one who tries to run away with the money, but never really outsmarts anybody. Uh, and so you, yeah, you, it's kind of this interesting picture too, because you have men, two guys who are kind of the same age, Dobbs and Curtin, but then you've also got Howard who's much older than they are, that he's uh, pretty close to getting, he's getting up there in, in, in years. And so it also kind of has this little lesson of it doesn't matter who, who you are, or how old you are, you can still learn. Uh, you can even go to show that there's still precious things to learn in life, uh, which is especially shown through Howard. Uh, one of the things that I kind of had an issue with here in the beginning, but I think it does actually serve the story the more I think about it, is it did feel a little too convenient that Dobbs, they need money. They need at least $600 each to go on their mining expedition, but they don't have that kind of money. Well, it just so happened Dobbs had bought a lottery ticket from a kid. He just so happens to win the lottery having that money. Which is like, oh, hey, now the, you know, the movie can continue and we get to go on an expedition. At first I thought, oh, that's pretty convenient. But I think it goes to show you that anybody who would win the lottery, you would think would just be grateful for doing so. But, and he said there, right, I, I just quoted the line. He's like, you know what? If I found this much, I'd be satisfied. Well, he just won the lottery. And now he's just hungry and eager to go get more money. He's like, oh, wow, cool, I won. Who cares? I just want to go get more money. So in that way, I think it does serve the story well to, sh to show his character's disposition like that. And I would even say that it kind of goes into talking about gold itself. Uh, I have written my notes here that gold is kind of equivalent to winning the lottery. Uh, or maybe just the lottery in general. You have to be extremely lucky to find a place where gold is at. And then once you get that, the revenue you get from mining that gold can kind of drive you mad. Kind of a similar way to how we hear a lot of stories about who people who win the lottery, they think that they'll be, that they're going to be very happy. And then when they do get all that money, they totally are not. And their lives are more or less just demolished because of their, because of the money that they have. Uh, I, I just learned about this in, uh, in psychology that uh, we tend to, I forget the technical term for it, but we tend to, overemphasize a lot of things and so when we think that there is potential gain for a lot of, for like maybe in the lottery or something like that we tend to overemphasize what we think what happened we don't know how we don't we can't necessarily predict correctly what's going to happen and so when that happens when then we lose all that money uh then you have a then of course we're really we kind of go into somewhat of a depression or even go a little bit mad because and once again this is also something i learned from that class is that loss is much more impactful than gaining something hmm. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating. So, I, I hadn't really given much thought to that, but I'm sure it is because, I don't know, I think as fallen humanity, we're geared towards just wanting more. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why, you know, it says in scripture that it's very hard for a rich man to enter heaven. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, which would be impossible, you know, right. and I think the movie kind of uh, speaks to that as well. One of the more kind of funnier things I want to mention, did you notice in when they're having the bar fight between McCormick and Dobbs and Curtin, 
that it's not the actor McCormick. It's obviously a stunt double that's fighting. It's so obvious. I kind of wondered if it was a stunt double, uh, but I guess I didn't necessarily look look too deep into it. But I guess that doesn't surprise me because I did know something different. I've just noticed because I've been watching a lot of older movies recently and even some yep. of the older James Bond, they have no idea how to hide a stunt double. Even an old Charlton Heston movie, it's like, wow, that they don't, they like almost don't even have the same like weight to them. They're like completely right. different weights and sizes. And today they're so great at making the same actor and stunt double look like the same. But in this, I listeners go back and watch this fight scene and pay attention to McCormick because for the wide shots, he loses like 20 pounds. And then for the close up shots, it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's clearly his face. And speaking of this scene too, it's, it's, it is kind of fascinating how far we've come in action scenes in our more recent day and age, oh, because, yeah. <laughs> uh, compared to newer movies, this is a relatively tame action scene, I guess you could yes. say for the time, of course, it was very influential. Uh, it, and still even now, it, at least it serves a great purpose, but it, it is kind of showing its age here. And, but it is interesting though, that I would like to point out, you kind of, brought this up briefly but there are a lot of wide shots to this little little skirmish in the bar you don't normally see that with more recent modern movies we tend to be very very close in in the actress's faces that are having a little fight with this one it's rather wide for the most part it's it's all wide shots and it shows you a lot of of stuff that you normally wouldn't see because it's usually moving around quite a bit in more modern movies just kind of want to bring that up yeah and i mean it shot really well it's kind of shot actually from the floor up which is kind of cool and when we do get later on into the movie there are you know some decent wide shots of the landscape uh one of my favorites is when uh the bandits are coming up the mountain when they first see that i'll i'll wait to talk about that scene but that's one of my favorite parts of the movie it's i'll wait i want to talk about it but i'll wait uh but anyways i you know like we were saying how the action is, yeah, back then action was fairly cheesy. The punches sounded fake. When people got shot, there's like no blood. And it, it was just extremely tame. Whereas now today it's, right. oh my gosh, it's, you know, probably not necessarily hyper violent where some of it is, but I would just say realistic where we're shocked, but it's like, that's right. probably really what happens when you shoot somebody or <laughs> when you do that. But I do think for the time and even today this movie is fairly violent um probably from beginning to end because we see that and i think that is going uh that's like speaking to how uh kind of the base nature of humanity how even from the beginning even in the civilized world of tampico people are using violence to get money from other people despite it being 1925 and uh that's probably because it's post world war 1 but at the time of shooting it's post world war 2 so it's a much different world um where the world is not as probably sane as people think it used to be because of this horrors of mass destruction and war right. and uh i do think that's really interesting though how the violence is always used for just like just like really petty things It's not like, oh my gosh, you shot my brother or you are, you know, coming after me personally. It's like, no, you owe me money or I want more of your gold dust than you. I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to bash you over the head with a rock. You know, I'm just going to beat you up or in the end, it's really violent. We don't see it. Um, But I do think there is something to be said about how they don't show the violence, how that could be even more effective where he just, before you know it, chops him with a machete three times. Uh, just right. without even giving it a second thought. Uh, it's interesting. Right. And I did see that the reason why they didn't exactly show that is they were originally going to have Humphrey Bogart's head being chopped off and then show it rolling on the ground into the little pool that was there in the oh, location. Wow. Really? Hayes' code was like, uh, no, <laughs> you, you can't you can't do that. Um, so they chopped it out. And even then, I think the, the director, uh, Houston, was just like, yeah, it still works, though. Yeah, I think that probably would have been a bit overkill and almost would have made it a little cheesy. I think I, I thought it was just as impactful without seeing his head roll into the muddy pool. 
Right, right. I, I, he's. I think he did mention that it, it kind of still gets the same message across. Maybe it was home. Maybe it was Bogart mm. himself. Uh, either way, yeah. Even for the time, that's just like that's. I mean, for the move for the mo- time the movie came out back in forty eight, that would have been really overly violent uh, compared to anything else. No wonder it didn't pass the hates code. Yeah, uh, I will say this story is like at least the plot, like the story beats, is much simpler than the previous two Bogart movies we've reviewed. Yeah, and to be fair, uh, at least from uh, Maltese Falcon, that one was much more of a police investigation. Uh, so that one, those are typically just naturally more complex. Uh, and then this one, yeah, this one definitely has a very straightforward story to it, which does make a lot of sense because you're just kind of, you're not really going back in time or anything like that. You're usually staying along the same track and everything that happens from here is going to expand upon it a little bit later. So, yeah. I'll say this so far is probably the most accessible bogart film we've reviewed because the maltese falcon you can hear our review and thoughts on those movies but those movies are so complex like you really need to pay attention or else you're going to be lost who and why and what is going on this movie is very straightforward i would say with its plot and premise but it does get to fairly deep issues about the nature of humanity yeah yeah it's it's uh more so than both the movies, like I think you just mentioned this uh, earlier before that, uh, both these movies before Casablanca and Maltese Falcon, uh, they do take a bit more thought, I guess you could say, to really dive in and figure out what it's trying to say. This one, you can kind of, you can more or less get what it's saying on like a first, maybe even second viewing. Uh, it's pretty forward with what it's trying to say, not that it's a detriment or anything, because I think it still really works the way that it tells its story. Uh, but it is like you, like you were saying, it is a bit more accessible, a bit more easier to understand than those on those two on a first viewing. One of the issues I had with um, probably the sound design of this movie—I don't, I guess you could call it that back then—is when mm-hmm. they're trekking through the Mexican wilderness or even kind of the Mexican jungle with some of it. They use the same noises they do in like the Amazon jungle movies. Uh, if you watch like King Kong, the 1933 King Kong, or just it, Creature from the Black Lagoon, it's the same noises. Mm-hmm. They think all jungles sound alike. And maybe that's, maybe people back then wouldn't have known the difference. I guess now, since we have yeah. YouTube and Animal Planet, we know they don't sound like that because they have different animals and stuff. But to me, that just, I just thought it was funny and that took me out of it just a little bit. When I hear these, like, I'm like, wait, I've heard that in the, Amazon jungle and creature from the Black Lagoon. Right. I would say one of my small issues with this is not really here, but kind of before these scenes. Uh, Getting to this point in the movie, it's kind of choppy. Uh, Now, to be fair, everything that they show is very relevant to the movie because it goes to build and introduce uh, Curtin and show that the gate these kind of going to foreshadow what's going to happen later on in the movie when they uh, find out when they find McCormick. But for Kind of, especially when they get into working with McCormick, it's just kind of feels a bit choppy. It's not really that big of a deal, but it's something that I did notice when I was watching it. Uh, once again, relevant, but still there. Yeah, I think their journey getting there is, it feels really long and it's really arduous, which kind of confuses me because later on when Curtin has to go into the village, it makes it seem like he is able to go from their campsite to the village within just a few hours, within the same day. But we know it took them many days to get up there, and then it takes them a really long time. I don't know, probably at least like four days to get from their campsite to back down the village because we see multiple nights occur. So uh, kind of the time frame of getting to different places is uh, when they want it to feel more longer than it does, but then when like, hey, he needs to get to the village right away, then he's there. Right, right. I mean, yeah, for the most part, for me, uh, I saw it, but I'm just like, eh, it's not that big of a deal because it does still get the point across. And even in those scenes, uh, really, after I thought the first 20 minutes or so, it's pretty much fine up until those scenes when uh, the timeline kind of gets a bit skewed, where you don't really know where we're at or how that person got to that place. Yeah, either way, it's it still does a very good job at... Uh, letting you allowing you to see the progression at least of of all of these characters as they kind of get more money and how they all react to it i did conclude that the movie begins in february 
and ends in July, so it takes place over about five months. Okay. I they, they think they mentioned the, how long it took there towards the end as well. Um, I did find one of the lines to be funny and also, of course, kind of a ironic foreshadowing. Because when they start suggesting, hey, we should probably split this up and each person be responsible for their own gold. And then Howard's like, yeah, sure, you all start hiding it and get really paranoid and suspicious of each other. And then Dobsey uh, says to Howard, he says, what a dirty, filthy mind you have. I thought that was so funny. And it comes to find out that's what he does. Right. And also as well, we see uh, Dobbs himself kind of gets a bit par- paranoid when they get close to his money after uh, it's a, it's a, it was some kind of monster. Yeah, it was, it, up real it quick. was the, the Gila monster. Sort of down. That's it. Yeah, the Gila monster. When the Gila monster crawls under this rock, which is where Dobbs' money is at, he immediately goes like, gets really tense about it. And it's blaming Curtin for trying to steal his money and all kinds of stuff like that. When in reality, he was just trying to get the Gila monster and shoot it. That way, it wasn't it wouldn't bother them. Uh, but it just, yeah, kind of just goes to show once again that hypocrisy in his character. Yeah, and Dobbs is almost. He's like, it's almost worth sticking my hand in there to get bit because he's so paranoid that he's wrong and right. they're right. And they're like, okay, if you do that, you will most likely die. And ultimately, he gives up. And we see many times throughout this movie where. Dobbs should have died either from the mind collapsing in on him, getting mm-hmm. bit. I I think um, Curtin probably should have shot him, but then that probably would have been, because Curtin doesn't die, then that would have been a big moral dilemma. And we would have probably, at least the audience at the time would have turned against Curtin and would have probably messed up the heroism and how everybody views the characters of the movie. Right. But for that mind cave in, this is really the only time I have an issue with the score. It's when Curtin almost leaves him to die, but then when he makes the choice to go in there and drag him out, this really triumphal percussion when he saves them. That just, to me, sounds so rote for how old scores sound in general. I think there's not a lot of differentiation between them at times. Not like today's scores, how they just sound so unique and different. Um, we've talked about this before, but that was probably my big issue with the score there's a few other times with the score where i think it's actually really brilliant but i don't know Mm -hmm. what did you think of this score part yeah and see that's kind of the thing just kind of in general with this score is that i didn't ever really notice it i mean it's i knew it was there but i never really paid it much mind i think partly due to the fact that i never really found anything to be that spectacular uh what i did hear and what i do remember it sounded good but for the most part it's not like i really remembered too much uh, or we took note of many of the times when it was used. I'm really satisfied with one of these next scenes where Curtin tells of his time as a kid, as a peach picker one summer, and how he just uh, loved that so much. And he has like such fond memories of that. And I think that captures the essence of childhood nostalgia really well. But I think it also goes to show just the desire for a simple life is despite having all of this money and wanting to, you know, be well off and take care of yourself. They still want those uh, more simpler things in life. And I think it helps develop Curtin's character a bit more because I've felt throughout the movie that Dobbs and Howard are getting the spotlight and their characters are like getting more attention and more like depth with the writing. Whereas Curtin is just kind of, this almost like secondary character in a way, but I do think this kind of helps bolster his uh, persona. Yeah, and in the scene too, we do find out that uh, Dar da, Darb Dobbs is uh, Dobbs's dream of what he's going to do with his money is much different than Howard and Kurtz because in this he talks about how he's going to kind of like he's going to live in luxury and do all of these kinds of things and even goes on to say that later after this is that twenty five thousand dollars is small potatoes uh, and it, you get this sense which we has kind of been leading up to this point that Dobbs uh, he's really only caring about the money and whereas where whereas with Kurt and Howard they're taking that and they're going to do something that kind of gives them I guess more life 
uh, or makes them live life in a much different way, something that they love to do, which for Dot, with for which for Kurt is to live on a peach farm, a very simple life. But for him, that's something that he just really wants to do. That's something that he has been aspiring to do his entire life up until this point. And kind of the same with Howard is a bit different one, wanting to get a grocery store and settle down and stuff. It's very interesting how uh, Dobbs. I guess you could say doesn't really even know what he wants to do other than the fact that now he has this money uh, he doesn't really know really what he could do with it maybe because he's just so infatuated with it that it's just kind of been coming or it's becoming to overtake his mind instead of doing what he loves to do is just doing what ever makes him happy with this money whatever that may be well right after this is when Dobbs tells Kurt and you owe me you know, $600 for helping you go on this expedition with us, which I think saving his life from the mine disaster should have made them even. But regardless, right. he gives him, he's like, well, here is your share plus interest. And this, this is a really important scene because Dobbs throws the gold into the fire. And we can right. contrast that. Well, I guess I should say more so compare it actually with the scenes towards the end where he is so covetous of the gold and he doesn't want to get rid of it. And in fact, he actually wants more. And then when the banditos come and uh, kill him and steal his gold, they also throw it away into the wind, which kind of shows they're really just one and the same people. And I think this scene goes to show that the gold really means nothing to Dobbs because he's like, I'm basically just going to use it on, I'm going to blow it on superficial items and put off yeah. a really successful, powerful impression on everybody who sees me walking around in my zoot suit. And I think this is what Dobbs is doing here is he's just showing the idea of maintaining and attaining this superficial power. Yeah. Yeah. And even then, Dobbs has been shown up until this point, and even especially there towards the end, that he doesn't really have much regard for human life, especially there towards the end, because he kind of puts himself in danger and then ends up dying because of the money that he's trying to protect. Uh, this kind of goes along with the uh, the uh, Ela monster there at the beginning, uh, towards the beginning, and then here, of course, at the very end when the bandits come and they and come and raid him essentially, and then end up killing him, and then drop his money. And to to them, they if had they known what it was, they also could have been very very rich. But they don't really care, and they think that it's just sand, so they throw it away. And it's also kind of gives this image as you see the gold on the ground blowing away into the wind, as if it, it doesn't really matter. Gold is it's a material thing, anyways. So what's really the point of it in the long in the grand scheme of things? There's a line I really like that Howard says to. Dobbs, he says something up your nose, blow it out, it'll do you good. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty funny and creative. And I do think Howard's character, and John Houston wrote this character of Howard specifically for his dad. His dad said, when you go off to Hollywood and you become, you know, Mr. Successful Movie Director, he said, I want you to write a role for me that I can really sink my teeth into and have a lot of fun with. So John Houston wrote this role specifically for his dad. And uh, I think that's also what makes the character so great and so special is because he knows his dad and he knows how well his dad could embody the role. Yeah. And he, you can definitely see some like fatherly figure out of Howard and how he acts and how he interacts with these two with these two guys in the story too. Absolutely. Now the movie gets I think the movie gets really interesting and I think this is what the movie really needed and it's the introduction of Cody. Yes. Uh it's really interesting because once again we're called to question ourselves uh how trustworthy would we be in a situation like this because it's really easy to judge them up there and be like dang they're so untrustworthy um dobbs is really taking it too far and they're really paranoid but then when you come to realize it and think about it you're like wait a minute they've got something really good going on here it could be completely ruined if they bring somebody else into it and i think we've always we've all been there in some situation in our lives whether it's a group of friends or something we've got going on where a fourth member or somebody comes in and it's like what are you doing here you know, we, you're, you're not a part of a group. You're not a part of a clique. Get out of here. And uh, I think Cody is a really great addition to this gang. And although his part is brief, I think this is probably one of my favorite segments of the movie. 
Yeah, and when I first when we were first introduced to Cody, I was like, "Oh, okay, another character." At this point in the movie, why would we do this? Are we really going to add another character? I was thinking that it was that they were bringing in Cody just to cause some kind of conflict, which ends up not really being true at all. It's meant to show we get, got it begins this idea that the real value in life is something much more than just money. And that begins with Cody, even though he himself is also up there looking for gold uh, in, in trying to help out, or trying to get in with some guy with this guy, uh, Kurt, and hopefully also trying to find some gold himself. Uh, he, they try and brush, brush it off as, Oh, we're just some humble hunters. But then he quickly calls them out and says, there's not much game up here. Uh, and they're like, Oh, I didn't notice. So it is. It is quite interesting how his character. Once again, I've the the. I guess what I've been used to seeing uh, is what I think is going to happen, and then totally doesn't there towards the end. And one of those things where I'm just like, "Well, crap, that's a better way of doing it than I, what I would have thought." Yeah, Cody is a smart character, and he's really not there to mess things up for them. He said, "I'll help you guys, and I'll only take what." You know, I work for. I'm not going to ask for an entire share of it. And that seems completely reasonable. And what is Mm -hmm. very unreasonable and really insane when you think about it is they are all willing to murder him just to keep their gold a secret. So they really all have this dark moment here, despite where Howard and Curtin end up because they take a vote and and Dobbs is like, you're not opposed to killing, are you? Dobbs wants to kill anybody any chance he can get. In this movie. Right. And I mean, right before they even started digging, he says to Howard, I'll bash your head in with this rock. And um, even Curtin, it's shocking, says, yeah, I'll uh, kill him. And I think this movie does a great job of kind of showing how there's these um, kind of belated consequences to their actions. So Curtin is willing to kill Cody and Cody dies. And then later on, Curtin is shot as well. And... uh Dobbs also wants to kill him too, and later on Dobbs is killed as well. So I think this it does a great job of kind of showing these like consequences to actions. Even if you don't necessarily do those things yourself, regardless, you are going to do that to somebody else and now it's coming back upon you. And I think it's I think the scene works so well because they're willing to murder Cody and then the bandits come, so it's kind of like this has been revisited upon them tenfold because now they have an even bigger problem to deal with that will most likely kill them in the end. Right. And this this also goes to the thing that I think I found to be the most fascinating is that this movie does a really good job at like it, bringing in an idea and then expressing it and then taking very little time before it begins adding on and exploring this idea. And so this is a great example of this Cody when he's introduced uh we and then he dies he we get this idea that you know life of course is better is more is more valuable than just money. And so yeah, I was like okay, yeah, it makes sense. But then it begins very quickly to begin to start expanding and exploring this idea and not long after that uh we are they're already talking about how they're going to go to Dallas and visit the wife because it's the right thing to do and then not long after that after they after they're walking down the mountain Howard is brought to or no before this Howard goes to this village and helps this little kid and then ends up staying in the village a bit later on uh this movie does a really good job at expressing an idea and then taking very very little time before it actually starts adding on and, and exploring this idea instead of playing foreshadowing games although it does still do that with some of the some of the ideas here the one some of the big ones it just wastes no time and expressing this idea, showing you what it's going to be, and then adding on to it. So it sounds like you were surprised when Cody died. You weren't expecting that. Yeah, I know. I was expecting them to actually shoot him and have him kind of play a very minor role and just kind of go, just kind of going to show that they're just all kind of going mad. But that's not really what happens. It's the bandits that shoot Cody. They had no, they really had nothing to do with it, uh, his death. But it's the it's the what happens because of his death, what they find in his like in his personal documents that really affects the characters and really pushes this idea. A few films, like more modern films that have, you know, been very prestigious with the awards they've won and like in the cultural zeitgeist that kind of make me think of this movie and undoubtedly have been drawn upon from this movie are No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood. 
Absolutely. And Absolutely. I kind of think of uh, Josh Brolin's character in No Country for Old Men a bit like Cody's character here. And I'm, I'm not trying to spoil No Country for Old Men, but it's kind of hard not to talking about this scene. But Cody is regardless a small character, but he is still central to the plot and how it shapes the rest of their lives and how everything will turn out. And Josh Brolin is the exact same way, but with the way he goes out in No Country for Old Men, it's really shocking because, first of all, it's off screen, which threw everybody off. And then you kind of come to realize that he's actually not really the main character, just kind of the main driving force behind the plot. And um, right. the other thing with No Country for Old Men, I love both of those movies. No Country for Old Men begins with Daniel Day-Lewis mining for gold in the beginning. And then eventually he becomes so greedy with uh, mining for oil that he uh, pretty much just like loses everything. And also there's, remember when he becomes so paranoid because he believes that guy is not his brother. And he also believes that guy is just there to like take whatever he wants and uh, he murders him. That reminds me so much like Daniel Day Lewis's character of being crazy reminds me so much of how Dobbs is completely insane, especially the scene where he makes him dig his grave and it's at the fire at night and he shoots him just like he shoots right. Curtin. I'm like, OK, I know Paul Anderson saw this movie and drew some inspiration and the Coen brothers saw this as well. Oh, yeah, I I'm I'm sure. That that's exactly what happened because it it makes no it's no surprise to me the parallels that are between these three movies because in some sense they are all rather similar uh, they are all dealing with this idea of greed uh, but clearly they're pulling some inspiration off of this movie those two movies are and of course we can't go by without uh, the super famous line of course that is misquoted it is I, I noticed this because okay. Uh, We've all we both seen UHF, yeah. and that's where it it kind of I guess maybe even helped popularize this quote um, a little bit. But even that got it wrong as well. It's not badges, badges. We don't even know it's thinking badges. It's a bit more than that. Yeah, it is. I didn't write down the full line, but the part that people misquote is um, the real line is badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard that line a bunch, yeah. and this is where it comes from. Right, right. I think I, I don't know if I have the whole quote down, but I have wrote, I have written down badges. We have no badges. We have we don't have we don't have to show you no stinking badges. Yeah. That's a great line, and I gotta say uh, that character is so great. I I wrote down his name. Uh, he plays the character of Gold Hat, and that character who plays Gold Hat is so great. In this scene, he's played by Alfonso Bedoya, who is a Mexican actor. And when they came down to Mexico, John Houston saw him and he's like you're perfect for this role and he cast him in the movie and uh the other thing i forgot to mention was you know cody comes late into the movie well he was actually cast late into the production of this movie which is just an interesting aside but uh alfonso yep. bedoya as gold hat he's such an iconic character he's so creative he's got his like hat strap like over his mouth and uh yep I just I love his character. He's such a great addition to this movie. Yeah, he absolutely is. I love how uh, he is essentially what Dobbs is. Bob's is Dobbs is essentially going to become there towards the end, uh, where essentially the bandits really are just trying to get their hands on really anything that they can. Uh, and then with uh, it's kind of the same thing with Dobbs's character. They they run kind of run in parallel almost, and Dobbs comes closer to becoming what Golden Hat is, and he, of course, Golden Hat becomes uh, a recurring idea or a recurring character as the movie story moves along. Uh, we do get a scene in the very opening with the train robbery, and the three men defend against the train, and you get a brief glimpse of him, and then he comes back a couple more times as the movie goes along as well. Uh, and then at the very end, he has to dig his own grave, and he's shot by the firing squad uh, by the Federal Allies. And isn't it funny when before they shoot him, he's like, "Can I put? Can I wear my sombrero?" Yep. Shot. Yep. That's a great part. That's a great little addition. But mm -hmm. um, oh, I, I did forget to mention that the shot of the banditos coming up the mountain. I have yes. found this to actually be, ever since I saw the movie, genuinely I have found this to be one of the most frightening scenes in, that I've seen in movie history because it just seemed like such a tranquil setting up there in the wilderness and then to see right. such violence visited upon it by not only these three men, 
who come and you know mess up the land and just just get all greedy and start murdering each other for just silly reasons but then just this shot of these bandits coming up there's they seem so small but they're coming up towards them and just kind of this impending fear just kind of this doom where it's like there's no way you're going to escape they're they're going to come up here and kill you and you're going to die um right it's such a great scene and um, one i would probably compare to in no country for old men towards the beginning when josh brolin is running from those people in the dark and they're they're in their trucks and they're coming after him and it's so dark but this the shot is so great oh yeah absolutely and it even kind of runs in parallel with what the men our three main characters are doing here in the mountain uh and they're kind of coming to see what was going on up here. And there's this line later on that's kind of interesting from Howard. He says, now we're going to have to more or less try and fix what we did to this mountain because we've raped her for all of our, all of our, uh, all of our resources. And uh, Dobbs' character is like, okay, yeah. sure. <laughs> and he just kind of brushes it off. And, of course, it kind of plays into his own his representation of the character. But I found it to be just a very interesting line, like you were saying. It's, it's a very tranquil place. And both these characters and the bandits are coming up and they're just destroying it more or less. Yeah, and the scene where they read the letter from Cody's wife, um, mm-hmm. it uh, really introduces some great humanity to these characters who seriously lack compassion. And this guy, you come to find out, they don't know a thing about him, and neither do we. And of course, they're apprehensive. And I should right. mention, I think it's a great shot when they said, a well, great scene when they said, how do you know that he was following you up the mountain? And he said, because he's here now. And they just look up and it cuts to him standing over there in the shadows before he walks right. over to the campfire. Great shot. And uh, you come to find out he's a great guy. He has a wife and a son and he came down there to provide for his family. They're ready to murder him. And uh, yeah, I think it brings that message into the movie without being heavy handed because we've seen right. such kind of this depravity of these people just, you know, murdering each other for this little earth mineral And then we come to find this guy who actually has these pure motives, who set out to do this for his family. I think that's a great scene in the movie. Right. And it really is long after this, too, uh, that the men from the village come up and they want to take how and once they want somebody to help out because they have a kid that's dying again uh, i guess yeah he dr- he fell into a lake and almost drowned and so howard goes to help him and this is probably my f- probably my favorite scene in this whole movie and it's just with no words and it's just kind of all music and it shows howard essentially help it, treating to this kid who's who is about to die and you don't know if the kid's gonna live he's i mean you there you do kind of see him breathing but that's not really the whole point of the scene um but you get to see Howard help this village out. And because that the, the village is very, very grateful for that. And it's just, it's probably my favorite scene in this whole movie because it's for one, it's very different from the rest of what all we're seeing. It's very peaceful, but at the same time, very, very suspense filled because you don't know if this kid's going to live or not. But at the same time, it really hammers in this idea of how precious, uh, and what the real value of life is and how precious life is and things like that. It's this go- really, really gorgeous scene in my own opinion that i found to be one of those probably the most impactful scene of this whole movie and really the whole uh, narrative here oh yes i agree at first i thought it seemed to be detracting from the story it seemed to be an odd choice because they're going down the mountain and oh wait we're going to spend all this time with him helping the kid but then i gave it some more thought and i thought well this is actually important because it shows these people who have lived on this land for who knows how long they have no care for gold. They could have went and got out the gold anyway, but right. they have no use for it. I mean, it would only bring them just, uh, you know, finite material possessions that they don't care for. But whereas, uh, they care more so for human life for, uh, no amount of gold can't bring this child back. So whereas these three Americans come to the land that isn't theirs and they just do it to, get rich and they don't care for human life so i think the juxtaposition between we you know we don't really care about this gold we care more so about this young child is far more important yeah it is it's juxtaposed really well and it also kind of goes to show it is also kind of a foreshadowing moment there towards the end when howard returns to this village but it is also interesting too because howard essentially returns to the way that we first found him with no gold and really no money he lives in this village by his own merit with no money at all because to this village gold is like you said 
basically worthless. They have really no need to keep it because, for one, they're kind of excommunicated from the rest of society. But at the same time, what are they going to do with it? it? I mean, yeah, it's here and it's all over the place, but to what purpose does it serve them? So I really like this I, this image that Howard returns right back to the way that he started, which he even expressed that there is a very big danger to searching for gold there at the very beginning when he is talking with Dobbs and Curtin. And once again, I, I would also say there's even more juxtaposition um, where Howard is kind of living in this kind of Garden of Eden-esque area where yeah. they're just living in peace and it's really nice. But then not very far, you could say east of Eden, we've got Cain and Abel pretty much. We've got one good, one bad. Dobbs and Curtin, um, you know, preparing to kill each other, essentially. Right. So we've got that tranquility and paradise going on. And it's you see life without gold is much easier and simpler. And um, so I would say probably... Some of that anti-capitalist rhetoric has been toned down for the movie. I think more so they're not trying to um, speak against an economic system, but mm -hmm. more so speak against materialism, which I'm completely okay with, or consumerism, whatever you want to call it. And yep. I, I think there is a great uh, view of that here. Yeah, you, you, this definitely isn't one something that's trying to rip apart uh, capitalism and saying that it's a it's total evil and all, all that kind of stuff. It's definitely saying that there is a real danger to uh, to living with this kind of a lifestyle where money is all that you care about because if money is all you do care about, then your humanity is essentially lost at that point. Yeah, it, it, it definitely isn't. I mean, I guess the novel, it sounds like it kind of took this and really pushed it. Uh, but the movie wasn't really. I, it's hard to say. Had I not known the foreknowledge of the novel, it's hard to say that this is that this movie is terribly anti-capitalism, and uh, not really. Oh yeah, no, absolutely not. I, I wouldn't say it was, but I will say this third act, probably the end of the second act and this third act here, is probably my favorite sections of the movie because so much happens and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's so thick, but it's also so interesting. Um, and this is where I think. Bogart's performance, his paranoid performance, it's been building and building and I've been loving it the whole time. But I think this is kind of the uh, third act here is where it really shines, yeah. where he goes full paranoid nutcase and you see him just like rocking himself. And I love how wide he makes his eyes and you can see the white of his eyes and his hair sticking up and he's rocking himself. And um, mm -hmm. I got to say, Bogart ceases to amaze me with his performances. Oh yeah, and I I know that in the opening when we were talking when you were talking about how all the critics and how they were acclaiming it, uh, you said this is probably their best performance they had seen from Bogart. I'm gonna have to second that. I think that this, as far as I'm as far as I've seen, this may be my favorite uh, favorite acting job from Bogart, and I think that's just due to the fact that his character is so dynamic because he goes his emotions in acting style were mo are moved all around the board here, whereas in the previous films, not to say he wasn't good because he was definitely really great in those movies, but they're more or less monotone. They don't the acting style there doesn't really move about as much here. It's not as dynamic. This is this feels really dynamic for his character compared to what we've had before. And I think that yeah, this might be for me my favorite acting from Bogart himself. Plus, I love how they, uh, the settings that they're in, um, they just seem to grow more sinister, how mm -hmm. the fire rises, and everything yeah. is just so shadowy and dense, and uh, even the trees look so barren and scraggly, and it just becomes kind of a much more uh, desolate setting, oh, it, yeah. it would seem, where they're just really far from civilization, and even when he does get to the watering hole... I think that's a brilliant scene where he's basically become an animal. Uh, right. He's drinking out of the watering hole with the animals. Um, I, I wanted to ask, were you shocked that Curtin is supposedly shot dead? I was a little bit. And the movie does kind of explain that it's really, really dark out there. So it, it was more or less the reason why Dobbs missed or maybe he didn't shoot to kill or right. maybe he did shoot he intended to shoot to kill but then didn't do so i was a bit surprised though that curtain still was alive there towards the end of course he was hardly living yeah. but yeah i was a bit surprised that uh that he still lived after that yeah i remember the first time i saw it i was first of all shocked that he did 
you think he murders Curtin. And I'm like, no way. That is that is shocking. And then come to find out Curtin's not alive, which I think is great when Dobbs comes back. Well, first of all, he's debating whether to even go look at him because he's like, what if his eyes are open looking at me? And then right. he's gone. And, uh, and he tries to explain it away like, oh, a tiger got him. Right. And he was afraid the buzzards would give him away as if no creature out there would die. And it's just complete paranoia and he plays it off so well. And then when he yeah. finally, when he finally settles it in his mind, he's like, oh, it's just like, you know, um, destiny wanted it this way. Like my power is so great. I just, it worked out perfectly for me that he, a, a tiger carried him off and he gives this right. maniacal laugh. Oh, it's so perfect. Yeah, he's com- he's become a complete narcissist at this point. His mm, yes. his the greed that's basically overtaken him at, up because now everyone's out of the picture. It's just him and the money. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's the narcissism is just completely overtaken his mind. And all he really cares about is himself. And he's paranoid that he's going to be found. But oh, it's okay. The tiger took him off. No buzzers are going to come around. And, yeah, it's quite an exquisite b- performance from Bogart here too. Oh, it really is. And I will say, I did notice the score was much better here in these scenes. Uh, there's a scene where Bogart is lying by the fire and like the fire is rising and you hear these like some really sinister strings here in the background. And then when he does laugh and walks off the scores, th- this is where the score shines for me and uh, does a better job, I would say, of kind of playing more so into connecting with what we're seeing there on screen. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I really do love this image as he's laying sideways, staring as his eyes are super wide into this fire as the fire continues to rise at this point it's pretty clear that he's kind of reached uh he's really he can't go back at this point he's gone so far into madness that he's not really going to head back anytime soon which he really doesn't when the movie ends he dies before he really has a chance uh to fix what he started like he ever even would have i guess would have really wanted to and i think it's great once he gets to the watering hole he encounters Mm -hmm. the bandits and he's like i've got a gun and they're like so what with your gun we'll take the chance we have nothing to lose you know we were being hunted constantly all the time. And I think that's fascinating because now it's just kind of like the animals fight it out amongst each other. And, Mm -hmm. uh, Dobbs tries to, you know, smooth talk his way out of it and say, well, I'll pay you if you go along here with me. But it's great to see how he goes from this really narcissistic power hungry murderer to, uh, pleading for his life. And it, uh, has that great concept of you reap what you sow and right. it comes back upon him so quickly. And I think the movie does a great job of doing that in general, where I already mentioned this before. Uh, nobody escapes unscathed in this movie. Yeah. S- some kind of consequences occur and more drastic than others. But how do you react? How do you deal with such a thing? It shows the dark side of humanity reacts in a very violent way. And then violence is visited upon them. Whereas you could laugh it off and just kind of quote the psalmist, you know, or Ecclesiastes and say like, you know, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. You know, it's just ultimately pointless in the end to strive after such vain things. And then they go on to have what would we would seem a peaceful life. Right. And even kind of adding on to that, we get a line from Howard pretty early on when they first meet him, when he says, water is sometimes more precious than gold. And then that line comes right back here in this in this scene with with Dobbs as he's pleading for his life. Or at first, we see him dive into the watering hole, try to get some water uh, right next to the animals. And then... Yeah, the uh, the bandits show up, and then they he essentially is brought down, brought to his knees, and pleading for his life. Once again, the water is sometimes more precious than gold. At this point, he's pleading for life, which water is always very reminiscent of uh, of giving life. But the water here, I found to be very, very dirty. It's all is very brown, which is I found to be very, very interesting uh, when he's trying to drink from it. And then you, not long after that, he's pleading for his life, and then is killed by the man in the golden hat by a machete, which is very interesting because it's not by a gun. Uh, which they have been shown to have guns. It's more gorilla. It's more of a more of a messy kind of killing. He does it with a machete. Yeah, literally. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Yeah. I also I can't believe Bogart stuck his head in that water. I know. It looked like he drank from it. I know. It, I can't believe he didn't get sick. Yeah, it, it's very much showing that he is insanely desperate to for water <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Oh, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, and I do really like Howard's line 
that when he starts laughing and he says the gold has returned from where it came. Yep. And I think that's such an amazing idea of how hard they strived. And honestly, it's kind of like uh, the game. What is that game? Not Jeopardy. It's like who wants to be a millionaire or something. Right. Or any of those game shows, I guess, where you get all that money and then it's like you could go home or get more. Well, kind of the human greed and like our overthinking abilities where we think we can always do more. And then eventually most people just go away empty handed. Yep. And uh, that's how it was. And it's such a great shot of it all mixing with the sand and dirt and blowing into the wind. And they thought it was just sandbags. They And, and I think that just goes to show that uh, evil people don't understand uh, what's truly worthwhile it's kind of like pearls before swine in a way um not even uh like family like cody's family that would be completely wasted on them as well because there's just these roaming bandit nomads but i yep i gotta say uh, one of the best cautionary tales ever in this movie yeah and the the bandits don't make it out unscathed either uh, they are chased down and then are given the firing squad there at the very end as they dig their own graves. But yeah, it's, it's also interesting too that even still, Curtin and Howard try to try and go and save Dobbs still, even though they both know at this point that he's gypped them both and is running off with their money. Uh, they still have a little bit of respect for him. And of course, their main focus is more on the money. Uh, but it's still interesting that even though they haven't they haven't exactly been as corrupted as Dobbs had up until the very end. Then of course you get uh Howard begins laughing when they find that the gold all of the stuff to the gold, it's just the bag that it was in, which is totally empty now and it blows away in the wind. And now uh, there's a very interesting visual of that bag that held the gold. Uh when curtain rides off, uh you see the bag stuck to a cactus on the ground. Uh, and then of course you get that, that really, I found it to be a very funny line from Howard as he's laughing as he, and he says, this joke is worth 10 months of work and labor. Uh, and it's just, it's so, it's actually kind of strangely heartwarming that he's just accepted the fact that he will never have gold in his life and be able to live with it. And so what he goes back to the village and lives the rest of his life more or less in that village where really there is no money there is i guess no i guess there's a currency i'm sure but there's really no gold that's being traded there and curtain walk wanders off into dallas to i guess go visit uh cody's family and then spend the rest of his life as a peach farmer yeah very one of the best yeah one of the best cautionary tales especially when it comes to greed be i guess because it shows how many different viewpoints there are and some of the best ways and some of the worst ways and what could happen to a person, but at the same time, what really is the most valuable thing in life. And that was one of the kind of the main things that B. Traven was trying to get across with his novel and I guess with his other writings was that if we didn't care so much about material possessions, then life would be much simpler and easier. Easier. We wouldn't have as many wars and hardships and troubles. And I think that's fairly well represented here is when they do give up those material possessions, then they're still able to have what they wanted all along was, you know, a nice, peaceful, quiet life. And I really do think it's great that Howard says, take my share of what you get from the burrows and pelts and use the money for a ticket to Dallas to see Cody's widows. And he says, and remember, it's July. There's a fruit harvest going on down there. And I always like to think that Cody does go down to Dallas to actually take care mm -hmm. of, uh, or Curtin goes down to Dallas to take care of Cody's widowed wife and son, and they kind of have a happy life together. And I think this is a great ending for the movie. Oh, yeah, absolutely great ending. And yeah, I mean, of course, it also just kind of goes to show that, not necessarily to say that money is totally evil here, but more to the fact that just an overabundance of it can very easily be corruptible. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Alan, what is your rating and recommendation for The Treasure of the Sierra Madre? Man, I mean, I guess at this point, it really isn't that big of a surprise that I absolutely love this movie. Uh, it's, it's, I'm surprised I haven't seen it before this, the more I think about it, because I, one of my favorite things to watch just in cinema is to, ha is to show a character, build up this character, and then just tear them down and show essentially their descent their descent into madness i don't i find that i find that to be very fascinating especially when done correctly and this movie does a really good job at doing that but at the same time teaching a very very good lesson 
of how greed can very easily drive you in drive you insane and it kind of begins to make you think only about yourself and not about others and how you more or less just lose your entire value in in life here and throw the best things that are that what we can live with and what are in life are not necessarily the material things, but the, but the people around us. And I found that to be very, 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 very powerful, especially that, in, especially the very last image that it just leaves you with, with the cact, with the cactus grabbing onto that bag that held the sand, that held, uh, that held the gold that is now empty as it, if, as if it were sand, as it blows away in the wind there behind it. It's a very, very powerful movie and one that I'm glad I got to see and one that I would love to return to and dive even deeper into uh, even more so than we did here because it's it's one of those movies that I can see myself uh, really living off of his ideals, which is a very big compliment for a movie, I would have to say. Oh, no, 10 out of 10 for me. It's a high recommend if you haven't seen it. I'm so glad to hear you enjoyed this movie. This was your first time seeing it, so it's so cool. Yep. Your first time seeing it. We got to discuss it together here. And now you know why I love this movie so <laughs> yes, much. Yes, I do. Yeah. The Treasure of the Sierra Madre is considered by many to be one of the greatest films of all time. A pioneering film for its time, and to this day, it's well-renowned for its memorable story and performances. All for good reason. The Treasure of the Sierra Madre is my favorite Humphrey Bogart film. The story is accessible, the characters are deep, and what the film has to say about human nature should resonate with us all. Journeying into the enticing landscapes where fortune, prosperity, and also danger lies is a thrilling adventure I relish taking with these characters again and again. This is one of my favorite movies. Also, one of Bogart's greatest performances, where we get to see him flex his diverse acting chops by playing a multi-layered paranoid person. So far, I still feel Bogart plays his character from Casablanca just a bit better, but they're so different you may not recognize the actor as the same person. I had fond memories of watching this movie with my dad during the summer, and I look forward to returning to this film again. I'm giving The Treasure of the Sierra Madre... Nine stars out of ten with a strong recommend. Such a great movie, and mm -hmm. I am so glad we got to review this movie. Listeners, we do want to hear your thoughts on this movie. We want to hear what you thought it had to say with the different themes and how that spoke to you and what you noticed in it as well. Next week, we will be concluding, for now at least, our Humphrey Bogart retrospective series with The Desperate Hours which is very different from any of the Humphrey Bogart movies that we've seen, but I'm excited to review that movie and return to it. I've seen it a few times, and I was always very fascinated by it. It's quite scary, just to give you a little warning. Interesting. It's a, sc it's a scary one. I actually I think this might be the one that I've heard the, le the, heard the least about, um, so I'm pretty interested to see where, where the conversation goes. Yeah, it's not one that you hear talked of very often, but it's one that I thought would be good for us to review. And the other movie that is Bogart that I've never seen, but it's kind of one of his roles that really kind of helps him stand out for, from the rest. It's called Petrified Forest. Okay. I've always wanted to see that movie. It looks so good. Yeah. But listeners, we want to thank you for joining us on our review of The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. We love discussing films, and we love discussing them with you. Make sure to share this podcast with your friends and family if you enjoyed it. Make sure make sure to leave us a five-star rating on iTunes. That'll really help us in the rankings and get noticed by other people so they can enjoy talking about this, uh, talking about movies and talking about it all together. It's great to talk about movies together. You can follow us on your favorite platforms. Just look in the links in the descriptions below. They're really easy to follow. Just click those and that'll get you where you want to go. So you'll never miss any new content that we put out. And if you do want to support us, if you like this podcast, you like what we're doing, well, even less than the price of a Starbucks cup of coffee, you could even do a one-time donation uh, that will really help us keep the lights on. And with that donation, you get a lot of great exclusive content that is yours to download and keep forever, even if you did happen to stop donating. 
Uh, you would get bonus podcasts, our thoughts on the latest movie news and trailers, movie commentary. So when you watch the movie, turn the volume down a little bit and turn us up and you can hear our thoughts on those movies. We've got a lot of great uh, bonus content that's exclusive there just for you, just for a few dollars a month. It will help us keep the lights on here. That money doesn't go into our pocket. That money helps us pay for bandwidth and storage and hosting. It goes into all of those things. So if you like this, we really would appreciate a donation and we'd be very grateful for that and your name your first name and the initial of your last name will go up on our website as a thank you under the thank you page and under the donors page so we do want to uh, give you recognition and appreciation for that once again listeners thank you so much for joining us on this humphrey bogart retrospective series we'll be coming back next week with one more bogart review for now anyway and then after that we'll be coming to you with our Christmas special, and we will be reviewing Miracle on 34th Street, our final review of 2018. And then, of course, we will be coming back to you very soon after that, talking about our thoughts on the Oscars. The Oscars are coming up, and we will always do an Oscars show, giving our thoughts on what, you know, did the predictions match up to what we thought they would? Are we pleased? Are we not pleased? What we, what do we think will win? So all of that and more coming up very soon. 2019 is going to be a great year and we're closing it out the right way with such great reviews. Thank you so much, listeners. We'll catch you next time. And even then, this is this came out in forty eight, which is right in the middle of World War Two, or kind of more so towards the end. I always get the dates mixed up for World War Two. Started in forty five and ended in forty nine, right? I don't remember. I think it was like pretty much over at this point. All right, I have to look this okay. up. I don't want to be wrong again. World War Two. No, it ended in, okay. It started in 39 and ended in 45. Yeah, it's been over for a okay. while. <laughs> okay. Error. Let's try this again. I need water. My water runs out fast.